we're just going to punt tonight, and uh, I'll do my best to describe the amazing and beautiful display that I put together. Okay, <laughs> so just imagine it that way. Um, so raising a red flag on red flag gun laws. How many people even know, have even heard of a red flag gun law? Okay, few, but not everybody. So, do I even know how to operate this? Let's find out, shall we? Oh, there we go. So, um, they go by a bunch of different names, okay? So, red flag gun laws can also be GR GVROs, which are gun violence restraining orders, ERPOs, extreme risk protection orders, or STOP orders, which stands for severe threat order of protection. And uh, red flag gun law by any other name smells just as bad. These are, I'm gonna try to make sense tonight of something that makes no sense at all, right? Because these red flag gun laws truly make no sense at all. But when you hear someone that's in favor of them describe them, you can find yourself doing that little head bob, like, oh yeah, that makes common sense, right? <laughs> and you can find yourself sort of taking the bait uh, and turning off your, your thinker because their goal is your, your heart, their, your emotions. So uh, by whatever name they go by, uh, basically what they are is, broadly speaking, they permit a spouse, a parent, a sibling, a person living with a troubled individual to petition the court for an order enabling law enforcement to temporarily, okay, so now we've got two words that kind of, what do they mean, right? What's the definition of them? To take the individual's guns right away. So, golly, doesn't that just sound like it makes a lot of sense? How you've got a troubled individual, right? And, and law enforcement, we completely trust everything about law enforcement, and it's just temporary that they're having their guns taken away. <laughs> Golly, why would anybody be opposed to that? And really, you know, we've heard, um, and, and let me just make this point, that the Second Amendment, our gun rights, our gun laws, our constitutional freedoms, they are not political. They've been made political, right? So the, the people with the big D on their chest, they very much arm's length the entire Second Amendment idea. They're, they don't want anything to do with it. They want to paint those of us that do want to it, enjoy those rights, right? Enact those rights as there's something a little wrong with you, right? You're just a little bit off. So that's that's where the political part comes in. So, by comparison, the rest of us with the big R on our chest, or maybe the I, right, independent, uh, or libertarian, uh, the big L, uh, you know, we're, we're saying, no, 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 this is valuable. This dates back to our founders. There's, a, there's so many important reasons why this is important and we're trying to preserve it. And so, that's where that political Ization of the Second Amendment comes from. But truly, freedom is for everyone. And so, uh, as it has been politicized, of course, we've heard the Eric Swalwells of the world, right? Yeah. He wants to nuke those of us that have guns or something? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's Kamala Harris, who, uh, what is her thing? She thinks that she's going to get into office. She's going to be the president with her little crown on. And she's going to uh, enact an executive order or something yeah. to just do away with all of our <laughs> constitutional rights. That's what she's saying. And then Cory Booker, bless his heart, I think he, his talking point is he wants to have us all register our firearms, something like that. So we know that the, the Democratic Party as a whole is against our rights. Now, I personally have friends who are Democrats. They ascribe they, they self-describe as uh, politically or socially liberal, but yet they value their Second Amendment rights, right? So it's not every single Democrat, but the party itself has definitely taken this stance. But let's see, 
Who else is in favor of these red flag gun laws? Oops. We didn't expect to see that. There's a picture of Trump and a quote that I actually heard him say live on TV and freaked out a little bit because I love President Trump. And I, I believe in him. I believe he's doing actually God's work. So for him to make this statement felt so completely <coughs> off the mark. And he said, uh, I like taking the, the guns away. Take the guns first and then go through due process second. What are you saying? <laughs> right? Now, the date on this, it was February 28th, okay? So red flag gun laws do predate the Parkland, Florida high school murders, but this Nicholas Cruz murderer who walked into a school with no regard for human life, he is, he's been held up as the poster child, right? The reason why everybody's running like there's this huge prize for these red flag gun laws. Um, and so it was just a few days after the Parkland murders when President Trump said that. And he is nothing if not pragmatic. He is trying to get the straightest line to a solution at all times. And sometimes it causes him to say things that later, I'm, I'm hoping he cringed a little bit. Um, and so for that reason, because I understand he's a very pragmatic minded person, I, I'm kind of putting that in that category. And even if so, I am not of the mindset that it, if somebody that I supported or somebody that I voted for or whatever, if they do fall off the mark or they say something I don't like, I don't write them off, right? I mean, how immature is that, right? We have to take the whole package. We have to understand that they are our representatives and so they are representing not only me, but also my friends who live in the same district, right? Because he's the president for everybody. So uh, sometimes he is gonna say and do things that I'm not super happy about, but uh, I am not about to do that by any stretch. Uh, who else is here? Lindsey Graham. Democrats and the GOP can come together for gun confiscation law. So I have a little bit harder time giving Lindsey Graham a pass because I believe he's a very political creature. So we've got the pragmatic, now we've got the political. Um, I think he probably did this and he's like, okay, I think today I'm gonna say. Um, so I, I'm a little less happy with that. And then, God bless him, our Governor Ducey's down here in the corner. There's the one. <laughs> Governor Ducey, so he's taken the stop law, right? What did we say? That was the serious threat order protection. And he's kind of putting it into the school safety bill, kind of hiding it in there a little bit. And, you know, if, if something can't stand on its own two feet, there's a problem. And as you'll see as we go on, these stop orders definitely have a problem. Um, there are people that believe that uh, guns have no place in school whatsoever, right? And wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But you know what? There are Nicholas Cruises out there, and they are going to bring the guns into school. So personally, I am for not arming teachers, but not disarming people like me that no matter what my day job is, I am going to be armed. I'm trained, I have my CCW, I don't even have to have a CCW in the state of Arizona. So people like me don't need to be disarmed. I, I shouldn't have to leave a piece of my clothing at home, right? Um, because there are people like Nicholas Cruz who would never go along with the fact that guns may or may not belong to school. So this shows you kind of a, a dem uh, representation of the United States uh, there are currently 15, I think this is still current enough, 15 states that are dark red here that say that is where there's a red flag gun law by some name actually enacted. We are pink, which means that there, there has been a proposal for one, and then the grays are where they have not yet lost their minds and they understand these things are <laughs> dangerous. So we know what uh, those in favor are saying. What do the 
experts say that's a good place to, to look, right? The people that study this sort of thing, right? They study the law, they study human behavior, they study uh, you know, things that have happened to give us an idea of what might happen in the future. So at the top of that list, I've got the AZCDL, the Arizona Citizens Defense League. So in all um, full disclosure, I am a lifetime member of the AZCDL, and I have put in your little green bags there um, some information about them and what they do. And there's also a flyer about the red flag gun laws in there. Um, so they are the watchmen on the wall. They are the guard dogs in the courts. They're the ones that go through each one of these bills and, and they say, oh, school safety, that's amazing. Wait, 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 what's in there? Huh? There's a stop law in there. Back it up. Let's take a minute. So they say realistic policy solutions should focus on keeping the dangerous people, the people contained. Right? So on that previous screen, what did they talk about? The guns, the guns, the guns. So they've, they've mistakenly focused on the tool that is only as good or bad as the person that's using it for whatever they're using it for. The experts now say, oh, right, it's about the people and maybe containing and quarantining the person. Now there's a thought. So this Nicholas Cruz, right? He, everybody apparently knew if there was gonna be something wrong, it was gonna be that guy. And it turns out they were right. And he, you know, was running around just free ranging it, doing whatever it is he was gonna do. And no matter what tool they took away from him, he was gonna do what he was gonna do. So, had they quarantined him, we would have had a completely different story. Our nation would have had a different story. So, the DRGL, well, who are they? Oh my goodness, they are the doctors for responsible gun ownership. Wait a minute, I thought doctors hated guns. I thought all doctors were after your guns, didn't like the whole idea. Well, apparently not. There is an entire nationwide uh, group of doctors for responsible gun ownership. Amazing, amazing people, a uh, growing network of people. So they are experts who have studied this and they say uh, the process to accomplish good things, right, is arrest and intention of the guns, no, of the people, right? and then psychiatric evaluation and treatment when indicated. And then here at the bottom is the CPRC, that is the Crime Prevention Research Center. Now, Dr. John Lott is the founder of the Crime Prevention Research Center. He is, he's written books like More Guns, Less Crime and The War on Guns, but he doesn't even have a horse in the gun race. He is a statistician. He just reads the numbers and he goes, this is what the numbers are saying. So that's what his area of study is. He says that he's been studying them since they came into, into place. They've been around these red flag gun laws since uh, about 2014. And he says red flag gun laws had no significant effect on murder, on suicide, on the number of people killed in mass public shootings, on robbery, on aggravated assault, or burglary, but you know what they did have an effect on? They actually, the areas that had these, there was a slight rise in rape. Probably because rape is about power and people that want to assert power over others, they can definitely use these red flag gun laws to their benefit to be sure that the person they want power over has had their tool of self-defense taken away from them. All right, so what, what about our founding fathers? What would they say about this? And you know what I was thinking? It's just a shame that they didn't write it down for us. <laughs> <laughs> what were they thinking all those years back then? And if only, if only they had 
Oh, looky there, they did. <laughs> it's the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. There's one in each one of your bags. Look at that. You'd be shocked how many people have not taken the time to read that. That. And the Second Amendment, which is one of the rights that is infringed when these red flag gun laws are enacted, is 27 words. Everyone has time to read 27 words. So they tell us that these red flag gun laws trample on the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment, and the Sixth Amendment, and I'll break those down for you a little bit. But I wanted to double check those 27 words, the Second Amendment. I just wanted to be sure that uh, it, it did indeed, it does indeed say that, Show up being finished. thank you. The only time in all of this huge document, <laughs> the only time they ever use that clause is with the Second Amendment. They're like, okay, this is Constitution for dummies, right? This is you can't screw this up, right? Shall not be infringed. And then I double checked. I said, you know what? There's no asterisk there. It doesn't say unless there's a Nicholas Cruz who does something horrible. Unless you, your neighbor makes you nervous because they have guns. Unless Cory Booker and Eric Swalwell and Kamala Harris decide that's the talking points that, that they think is gonna be their, the way that they take to the White House. There's no asterisk there. Just shall not be infringed. The Fourth Amendment. That's about unreasonable search and seizure. So again, what did we say at the beginning? So the parent, a spouse, a sibling, they can petition the court, enabling law enforcement to temporarily take the guns away. Well, how are they gonna do that? That's that 4 a.m. Big old knock on the door. Maybe not just a knock. People with badges, empowered by the court to forcefully enter your home and take your property. Oh, just temporarily though. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry long, about it. How long is temporary? I don't know, <laughs> right? I don't know, you don't know. Apparently the people that write these laws don't know. And because we also uh, have the auction house that Richard talked about, we have helped families, many, many families over the years, settle out their estates, and you might be surprised how often a significant portion of, a, of, a, of a, an estate's financial wealth is in firearms. People collect firearms for historic reasons. There's beautiful engravings, right, on firearms. There's things that have been handed down through families. Uh, Firearms mean a lot to a lot of people. When these people knock on your door with the badges and the corridor and everything else, and they charge into your house, they're taking all of this wealth and they're not handling it and wrapping it in blankets and deck. They're grabbing them and dumping them in big plastic garbage bags, uh, garbage bins. As soon as you have a collectible historic gun, that now has scratches and scuffs and so on and so forth, value's now gone. It's just gone. And so then they take them, they, they put them in storage areas or somewhere and take a minute someday and look up how secure the property is that the police have taken. But really not, there's people, sure. things go missing all the time. And then let's say that they didn't completely ruin your collection and, the, and nobody did come in and steal it out of the storage room at the, the police department. What's your process for getting it back? I don't know. I don't know. And how about your reputation? Where do you, where do you go to get that back? Right? So unreasonable search and seizure and yeah, by the way, once those uh, court appointed, court-empowered people with guns and badges come to take your guns. Um, once they're in your house, anything they see, 
anything they see now they can act on. How many people have like, don't raise your hand, teenagers in the house? <laughs> if you were a teenager, would you have wanted people with badges and guns searching your room, <laughs> taking note of what was in there, and acting on it? I'm just saying. All right. Uh, the, four, the fifth and 14th amendment, no person, person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the sixth amendment, you know, the, the accused actually have rights. Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. Not with red, red flag gun laws, though. All it takes is somebody going, I don't feel comfortable. <gasps> right? The accused have the right to due process. All right, so with my radio show, Gun Freedom Radio, I've had the amazing opportunity to, to interview some really tremendous people. One of the guests I've had on my show is a guy named Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Do you guys yeah. know who that oh, is? Yeah. <laughs> I love him. Just love <laughs> is super cool the way he says my husband's name, Donnie. Donnie and Cheryl. Um, so usually uh, when you're in radio, you always know the answer to the questions that you ask so that it flows well, nobody gets tongue-tied or embarrassed or anything like that. But I took liberty this one time because I thought for sure Dr. Sebastian Gorka, oh. whose family fled communism, for sure, this amazing patriot who's out there, you know, uh, just on the front lines for freedom and for President Trump and all that, for sure, there's no way he's gonna get behind something like a red flag gun law. So I said, hey, so Dr. Gorka, what do you think of these red flag gun laws? And his answer was not good. <laughs> and I, I really, I'm not even 100% sure what I said back because you could have knocked me over with a feather, but he did say in fairness, right? He's kind of got out of this realm, kind of went into this realm, but he did say, but, but Cheryl, we have to be able to see something and say something. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we do. You're right. We sure do. Um, People were seeing something and saying something with Nicholas Cruz like left, right, and center. Right? And they didn't do nothing. Didn't do nothing. He's still free range. He should have been quarantined. Not his backpack. They wouldn't let him bring his backpack on campus. They quarantined that. How good was that? So uh, I looked it up. I double-checked it. And I made sure that, you know what, there is a way to see something and say something in the state of Arizona and in every single one of our 50 states. Here in Arizona, it is uh, AZ Title 36 530B. It allows for individuals, oh my gosh, we're back to the people again, not the tools, not the guns, deemed an extreme risk to be detained for evaluation for 72 hours. So there you go. We can, we can see something and say something. We've already got it on the books. We can quarantine the people that are scaring others, the people that are possibly a threat to self or others. And then going uh, further, again, from our Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership, they tell us that people commit violence to self and others through a wide use and variety of tools, far beyond firearms, and approximately one third of homicides and half of all suicides in this country have nothing to do with guns nothing to do with guns. So it therefore defies common sense, real common sense, to claim that denying individuals only one means, firearms, to complete an act of violence will prevent that individual from being an imminent risk to themselves or others. So we've already got it under control. We do not have to have these unconstitutional laws. Cheryl, what was that title again? It is the AZ Title 36-530B, 72 hour hold. Thank you, that's, that's the uh, health and, and general welfare <coughs> title. Uh, uh, possession of marijuana is in that one as well. So the red flag gun laws, 
are predicated on a, a bunch of false premises. Um, so I have a gun shop, I have an auction house, I have a radio show. My degrees are in psychology. <laughs> so, um, I don't know how that happened. But those of us who have studied human behavior, right? Those of us who uh, have made it our life's work to study the, this animal called the human being, we are the first ones to tell you that our ability to predict who is going to harm themselves, who and when somebody might harm others, we suck at it. We know this. We are the first to admit it. We have very, our, our predictive powers are lacking. Let's put it that way. So for us to think that just everyday Joes going about their life, thinking about the next, uh, what's that show that just ended that everybody was crazy about? Game, Game of Thrones. Thrones. Right? That they can predict that there's something up with their neighbor. Right? Um, he doesn't tie up his dragon. Oh. <laughs> I gotta get caught up. I know there's dragons involved in that show, but I'm, I'm like two years behind, so. Um, so another false premise is that taking just the guns away solves anything. We covered that. That, uh, here's the other thing. So they kick in the door, they go in four o'clock in the morning, they've got their guns, and they confiscate the guns that they know about. What about all the guns they don't know about? Right? Which in an ideal society, as far as I'm concerned, is all of them. They shouldn't know about any of my guns. Because shall not be infringed. All gun laws are an infringement. Anyway, that's another talk for another time. Um, so they take the guns they know about march them off down, lock them up in a room, and the person that was so scary that somebody had to make a phone call and somebody had to come kick their door in at 4 a.m., they're just still walking around. But suddenly they're free of all their homicidal impulses because the guns are gone. <laughs> Some of the guns are gone. There's always a ride. Does it? Thank you. A screwdriver. And what? People do that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that on CNN. <laughs> write that down and research that. Um, and here's the real kicker for me, and it kind of ties in with this little cartoon, which uh, maybe everybody in the room is old enough to remember Bewitched. Remember the, the neighbor? <laughs> Edna, Edna, you know, they're doing something crazy next door. Uh, Mrs. Kravitz, I think was her name. Yeah. Um, and now with these, does everybody have like the ring doorbell and the neighborhood watch? Some of the stuff that flashes up on my phone it's like, oh my goodness, do I want the people that are reporting, you know, a kid cut across the corner of my yard, be on the watch out for that guy, you know what I mean? Do I want that person to be the one that has the power to call up and say, they have a picture of a humongous AR-15 on the side of their truck. I don't feel safe. No, I don't want that person having that power, but the, the false premise that those closest to us always have our best interest. That's, that's not the case, right? Like how many Columbos do we have to watch or CSIs do we have to watch before we realize that if I get murdered later today, the first person they're talking to is my husband. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Those who are closest to us don't always have our best interest. That's a lot of times where the, the friction is. If you've ever watched a relationship dissolve of significant others or even a parent-child relationship dissolve the ugly has no bounds and those closest to us are also the ones that have the ability to get on our Facebook or our Instagram or our Twitter right and post up a bunch of crazy sounding stuff right before they call the authorities on us right or get on a laptop and do a, a search on how to make a bomb with a, I don't know, think of a thing. Pressure cooker, <laughs> Pressure cooker jar mayonnaise, I don't know, you know? 
and then make a call to the authorities. And that is one of the, the really insidious things about that, and I touched on this earlier. You know, suppose there's a, a lady named Sue and she's in a relationship with Joe, and Joe is abusive, right? But Sue has been empowered. Sue has her CCW, she's trained, she's got, you know, all of her situational awareness and her guns and she's got everything. So Joe knows that his ability to have power over her is very diminished as long as she's got that equalizer, that gun, that self-defense tool. So what does Joe do? Picks up the phone, calls the authorities. I don't feel safe. Or she was making some threats against her own life and I know she's got that, you know, whatever cool little pocket gun or AR-15 or whatever she's got. Um, Lady Smith and Wesson. Lady Smith and Wesson. I personally have a count set. It's all good. Um, so the authorities go and they take Sue's tool of self-defense away from her. And now all Joe needs is an opportunity. So, what's the next one say? So what would trigger law enforcement to confiscate the property of gun owners? Kind of the, we're getting back to we don't really know. The evidentiary threshold is so low. We don't really even know what it is that would cause a judge to say, all right, law enforcement, go and do your thing, other than if a judge has been notified, do you think that He's not gonna wanna cover his own butt. Like, what if he goes, nah, I'm sure, I'm sure Sue's fine. I'm sure she's good, <laughs> right? And now that's on the record. And then maybe Sue isn't good. Oh, that judge didn't take action. That's putting him or her in a very, very bad situation. It puts the police officers in a very, very dangerous situation to have to go to somebody's home, take their property, <coughs> right? To have to trample their constitutional rights because they're told they have to. They're not said, hey, you know, if you think about it later, you might wanna. No, they are told they have to. Um, so this creates an atmosphere where if it's not your gun-phobic neighbor, right? Probably we all know somebody in our life that's just kind of like, guns, oh my. <laughs> right? It gives me the shivers. Um, who's just uncomfortable with the fact that you've got a big AR-15 on the side of your truck. Um, not an actual AR-15, it's a wrap. <laughs> with flags, <laughs> bullets, it's pretty cool. Um, it could be your gun-phobic doctor, right? Do you feel safe at home? Do you feel safe at home? Right? Could be your gun-phobic child's teacher, right? So what, uh, little Billy, what does uh, mommy know? Does she have any guns? <laughs> Oh, I hear your grandpa goes hunting. How many guns does he have? Right? Or even your gun phobic lawyer. The next screen, I get to. Now what happened with the doctor and the lawyer? What happened to that client and professional privacy clause, huh? Well, let's see here. There was recently, like earlier this month, May 2nd, there was an ethics seminar where a bunch of lawyers uh, were asked about clients who have firearms. And these lawyers, the majority, the vast majority of these lawyers said, in these lawyers' opinion, the mere fact that a client owned a gun or had a firearm permit was enough to label him as reasonably certain to cause death or serious bodily harm. And they would report him to the police. He's made no threats. He has brandished no firearm. 
But again, I think it's that butt covering, right? What happened to attorney-client privilege? Thank you. I do not know. Red flag gun laws. They're making us all crazy. Truly. So basically anyone who reports to the authorities that they are uncomfortable with you owning firearms can initiate the confiscation of your property. So again, there are people among us, just like President Trump said, I don't want a dangerous person to have a gun. Do you want a dangerous person to have a gun? Somebody who's unstable, somebody who's planning, right? To do, no, but you don't take the property because we're not sure if they are or not. If you're that uncomfortable, then the person has to be quiet. The person, not the tool, not the property. So, you know, if we want to think that people really don't overreact, this tells you right here, this just happened. So, if you're like me and you're thinking, holy buckets, this is the craziest bunch of nutty that I've ever heard, and we've got to do something to help others understand how dangerous this kind of law is. Like these folks have taken their brains out and played with them and dropped them. <laughs> it's true, it's true, because it sounds crazy once you fully thought it through. But just like Dr. Gorka, if Dr. Gorka can say, but Cheryl, we have to be able to see something and say something, maybe he's unaware of these uh, title laws, right? So we have to help people be more educated and more aware. So what can we do? Well, I say engage your entire sphere of influence, right? Sometimes we talk about a circle of influence, but it's actually a sphere, right? Maybe I'm the low man on the totem pole, just started a job, right? I've got no real power, but we go to lunch together, we get in the carpool together, we hang out by the water cooler, whatever, go for drinks after. So you can engage your sphere of influence. Maybe I volunteer with an organization, and again, I've got no power. Now, I'm not saying to go out there and start, you know, like shoving things down people's throats, but you can find ways to bring things up in conversation and still be delegate, still allow them their time and space to, because initially, they're probably gonna go, no, that's wrong. You've gotta be wrong, right? So it's gonna take people a while. Um, to prevent these bills from becoming laws, write, call, make appointments with your elected officials. Now, I think I'm preaching to the choir a little bit in this particular room, right? But I'm a little late to the whole being politically active. I'm super excited to see how young and passionate you are. Holy cow. If I could, for only that reason, reverse the clock, I don't want to go through my life again. No, forget it. Forget I said that. Um, but to have that kind of passion at, at your age it's amazing the lives that you're going to impact. It's uh, thank you for what you do. Um, so I, maybe 12 years ago, when we got involved with the gun store, is when I realized the 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 things that politicians say so carelessly that actually cause people to vote their rights away, to give them away. Uh, I realized that there was so much misinformation and that I needed to educate myself better so that I could help others um, understand these things with no spin, with no real agenda other than to protect and preserve what our founding fathers fought and bled and starved and died for because they fought tyranny face to face so that we wouldn't have to. Um, so interacting with your elected officials, and I know it's easy to get fiery and it's easy to, to you know, kind of let loose on people, but um, you've lost your influence the minute you do that. Again, in this room, I probably don't need to, yeah, you're shaking your head, right? Be respectful, right? Don't, don't, just keep it up here. Don't get all caught up in here and, and call people names. Um, and then support uh, local and federal organizations like the AZCDL. Again, full disclosure, I'm a life member. Um, because they say governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. I 
mean, that sentence right there, if we could just sit there and think on that, meditate on that, unpack that, and are established to protect and maintain individual rights, every single individual, our rights for self-defense, our rights against unlawful search and seizure, our rights as an accused to be proven guilty, not assumed guilty. Um, so supporting groups like that uh, is key. And so this says questions, vague murmurs, talking amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has any of those, uh, any questions or comments or thoughts, expand on what we talked about. Uh, you really should go to one of these Tuesday nights at six o'clock when they have their uh, auction that's in the side of the gun store and look at some of those rifles and pistols uh, that come from the states. You, you, you know, you, you've heard about them, you, you know, seen them, but, uh, you know, you really should go and look at some of that stuff. My husband would drool all over them. <laughs> yeah, well, that, most, well, of them are, most of the good ones are under glass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> drool wipes off, so it's okay. Um, so those of, those of us that hadn't heard of these before, do you feel now like you have an idea? Did I describe them well? Are you sitting there thinking I'm full of hooey? <laughs> no. no. It's terrifying. It is. It really is. And uh, the fact that, that very, very intelligent people can be uh, caught up in them uh, and, and led astray tells us that we really have to keep our thinking caps on. Yes? Well, I'm just, I was just shocked a little bit by the fact that the law being slid in there, I've just always trusted my government officials to be having my six on stuff like that. And here's Tuesday sliding in. So basically what you're saying is we all have to be aware and be looking at the laws and whatever and make it an issue because we can get blindsided quite easily. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's where I used to be 12 years ago. I thought, you know, I, I educated myself enough to make a vote. But then I'm like, okay, you got it? All right, I'm going to go about my life. Yeah. Do good things, remember who you are, right? <laughs> make good choices. And then I part, find out they're not making good choices uh, for me because I never told them how to represent me. So yes, we do have to stay on top of it. Was there another one? I, I'm, I'm feeling the heat. <laughs> He's got that hook. Yes. <laughs> decided to not go with the call-in style. We are an interview show. So I reach out to experts in their field and I interview them for 10 minutes a piece, roughly. Um, and so it, it started out for two reasons. One, it was a marketing piece for our gun shop, right? To secure our position as the experts in, in our field. Um, but more importantly, and really where my passion is, is as I was learning, I knew that I needed to learn these things. So if somebody, if I'd see somebody on Fox News or whatever, uh, and I'd reach out to them and I'd say, hey, do you want to be on my show? And they'd say, yes. I'm like, what? Do you even know who I am? I'm nobody, okay? But yay, let's do this. Um, so as picking their brain, it was amazing to me that I live in the time and a place when not only I could see somebody on Fox News, I can get on my Facebook, I can DM them and say, hey, do you want to be on my show? And in an hour, I get an answer. That's amazing. But that I can without, I don't have a background in communication. I'm a psych major who is in businesses, right? That I can sit in front of a microphone and worldwide, I have an audience that is worldwide. When I look at my analytics and I see, man, we are hot in Sweden today. What is up? <laughs> right? What's going on in Austria? Why are they loving us right now? Um, that it's mind blowing. So that I can 
as I'm learning, I'm helping others to learn as well. Um, and it, it, truly, the shock is how truly friendly, how truly, there's so few egos I've run into because those of us who are passionate about what we're an expert in, man, we can't get enough opportunities to talk about it, right? And they know I'm not a gotcha show. They know that I'm not there to make them look stupid or bad. If somebody's gonna look stupid or bad, it's me because I'm the <laughs> one that's like, now I'm asking this question for my audience. <laughs> Wink. Uh, but really, it's me. Um, it's just been an incredible opportunity. It's opened a ton of doors. I've been asked to speak nationwide. I got to speak on the lawn of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. about our Second Amendment rights. I got to speak on the steps of the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. about a case called Heller versus D.C. It was their 10th anniversary. <coughs> And I got to speak. I was, it's amazing, this time and place. So I know if I can have the impact I've had, and I truly, I'm, I'm nobody. I just had an idea. And I sat in front of a microphone. All of us can have an unbelievably huge impact. I loved what you talked about, right? Getting out there, knocking on those doors. I know it's scary, Ugh, and it's hot. And maybe the person's going to be like, no, but CNN told me that Trump's a racist. <laughs> right? But the impact, you just don't even know the impact. I had a lady come to me two days ago, and she was kind of like one of these, hey, I just I wanted to talk to you because I really like Trump, but I can't tell anybody. <laughs> but I know I can tell you. <laughs> you know? That was an amazing moment for me. Right? Because every life she touches now that she's not afraid to share is gonna she's gonna be impactful for our rights and for the work that I 